Please take your Bibles and go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let me just say, as you're turning there, about a meeting I need to have with those. There's about 38 of us that went on Saturday up to the uh, Eagle Bay camp that we're considering as a church about purchasing. And so I'd like to meet with the men and women that went up there on Saturday. That'd be the staff as well as the deacons that were able to come. We'll just meet right down here by the organ piano side. And then uh, I'd like to get some feedback from you. And then of course, uh, we'll have a business meeting on Sunday night to see whether we move forward with that purchase. It's 105 acres, as you know, and it's uh, been used as a camp from the uh, Shantyman Ministries years ago. It's been sitting vacant for about the last eight years. And so we want to consider uh, what the Lord may have us do as a church family in regards to that. Also church family, uh, we do have the communication cards on the information desk, the visitor center as well. And if you have a question, if you have a comment you'd like to make in regards to this, we'd ask you to fill this out. Drop it in the offering box if you want to, or give it to one of the ushers or staff members, deacons, and that way they can feed it to us. And then that way, when we do have the meeting on Sunday night, we can uh, try to answer as many of those as possible. I've only had one uh, communication card uh, turned in to this point. I have had several folks uh, come to me and ask this question or that question. And so there's some common things that are coming up and so we trust we'll be able to answer those. But we can't sit on this too long because of the sale that's pending. And so we need to uh, either decide as a church family to move forward or not. So I trust you're praying about that. One thing we've been assured of through the history of the church is we take time, we pray, and God answers, and we have a God that's working back behind the scenes, and I trust that we'll be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit would have us do as a church family in regards to that. All right, First Timothy, you know we've been going through a series now, and I know I've been taking quite a bit of time on these uh, first uh, lessons, just giving an overall view. We looked at each chapter and what it, uh, what it really was uh, signifying, we have in chapter one, the call to service. We have prayer and service in chapter uh, two. In chapter three, we have the uh, problems in service. Here in chapter four, we have the people in service. And then we have now, excuse me, chapter five, the people in service. And then we have chapter six, the money in service. We wanna to touch base on these, uh, on these last two chapters, chapters five, as well as chapter six in regards to this. And you know, it's interesting to me that a lot of times, you know, uh, people don't ask for advice and, and help and things of that nature. And I think God anticipated the weakness of man when he gave us these particular books called the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon. I always add Philemon, some uh, scholars do and some don't. I, I believe that it's a book that deals with the continual uh, attitude of forgiveness that's needed in ministry. And so I add Philemon to that. But it gives us the instructions on how to operate the local New Testament church here. And because there's a lot of opinions, there's different geographical locations, different cultures, and we need to understand that the Bible is cross-cultural. And uh, so that there are certain ideas. We look at the movement today called the Contemporary Christian Movement. We see the worship, praise and worship movement that's out there. And so everybody's essentially doing that which is right in their own eyes. And yet God has spoken clearly in regards to the operation of the local church. And so it's so important for us to understand that and believe what the Bible says and align our lives up to that. And when we vary, then of course we have that plumb line that brings us back into focus, back into line so that we can do things right. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5 says this, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And I like what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 also says. It says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And that's something that we have to understand that anything of import, which is all matters of life, we, found the, we find the answer in the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. And so we believe that. We see here where 
You know, a lot of times people won't seek counsel and advice from other sources, but we have the mind of Christ. You know, I, I always think about how you see someone who's maybe invented something or maybe they've built a business and you say, look, I'd like to sit down with them and just sort of pick their brains for a while. And of course, uh, we say, wouldn't it be neat if we could just spend time with the Lord Jesus? And we can. As believers, we can. And we have the mind of Christ. Christ's mind for mankind is right here. It's not in a dream. It's not in a feeling. It's not rubbing shoulders with somebody else. It's really spending time with our God in the blessed Word of God. And so we see here as we look at 1 Timothy, I've entitled this uh, opening series as Encouragements While Working with People because the ministry is people. And even though the pastoral epistles are really geared for uh, a man, an older man, talking to a younger man in ministry, it really has applicable truths to each and every one of us in the local church. And even if in particular, a certain aspect of the passage does not apply to you personally, as far as directly, you still need to know these things because God has given us this information. And even though you may not uh, fill the role of a pastor, you need to know the role of a pastor so that you can be an encouragement as well as a prayer warrior in regards to those who stand behind what I always refer to as the sacred desk, the pulpit, and preach the Word of God. You ought to be praying, as we saw in chapter 2, for those in authority, those pastors as well, as we'll also see in chapter 5, because we get the messages and we give you and feed you from the Word of God. So you ought to be praying that we would have the message that God has for you uh, from the pulpit. That doesn't negate your walk with God, but it's also, uh, this is the way God has ordained uh, to really propagate His Word and to explain His Word and get it out there. Nehemiah chapter 8 is a great example of that, as well as the entirety of the New Testament as it's given to us. In the book of 1 Timothy, we do see that Paul is really like a parent. And what he's doing, he's giving instructions to his young protege, his uh, son in the faith, I guess you could say. We know from Acts chapter 16 that gives us the background of the man Timothy. We also know that Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And so being a young man in ministry, he needed to have some instructions. And sometimes young men are really reticent to really ask questions. They uh, are embarrassed at times, or maybe they feel like, oh, I don't want to put the older guys out and things of that nature. And uh, I'll figure it out myself. I have the same God and so on. And a lot of times they don't ask for that counsel and advice. They just go on about their business or they have the Rehoboam complex and they get with their peers and say, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? And uh, we see here that Paul now begins to lay out these instructions to Timothy because we do know from a study of the scriptures that he probably suffered from some form of intimidation. It tells us in this passage of scripture to, he had some stomach issues and he needed to take a little grape juice for his stomach's sake. We know that he was sometimes given to fear, fear of man. And so we find that he says, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And so there are these aspects of ministry that was very intimidating. And uh, there may have been that tendency for Timothy uh, not to really uh, ask Paul too much. And so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, God said, I've got to give some instructions to this man in ministry, so I'm going to give him these books. And so he used Paul to pen these words, and thereby we are helped today. We're given the template to use. We're given the pattern to use for the New Testament church. And so we see in these six chapters to begin with in 1 Timothy, we find that he's being very pastoral. Paul is being very pastoral, explaining things to, uh, to Timothy, and really uh, not only explaining the being kind, but yet forceful. He's practical in nature. This is a very practical book, and that goes uh, in line with the way I'm bent anyway. I don't look at myself as someone who's a theologian as such, but I do like the practicality of the Word of God, not just knowing what the Bible says, 
knowing what it means, but also how in the world do you put it into practice? There are a lot of people today that are professional students and they study and study and study and study and study and yet they never do anything. And so the Lord doesn't want us just to read his word, study his word. He has left us here for a purpose and he wants that purpose fulfilled and that is through the auspices in this dispensation of time through the local church and we gear it through the local church. We also find in this passage of scripture that he's very pointed. These are not suggestions. And today we live in a generation where people don't wanna make forceful statements. They're concerned about making forceful uh, statements. They're afraid to really, as they would say, stick their necks out and uh, uh, potentially get it chopped off. But however, Paul's not concerned with that. And God's not concerned with that. God is the one who has given Paul these words and I just want to just go through some of these chapters here and verses and show us some of these truths. Look at chapter, three, uh, one, uh, chapter one, verse three, and we see how pointed Paul is. And so don't be surprised if a preacher is pointed. Don't be surprised if he's bold, if he's sometimes brash, and sometimes he gives commands, sometimes he speaks dogmatically. Uh, we are to speak dogmatically in concern, in, in, when it concerns the Word of God. Look what it says in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That word charge means to command. And uh, we, it's a military type term. And we need to understand in this period of time, we are in a battle. We are in a warfare. And I think if you look at society in general as a whole, you would have to admit we are in a battle. And I'm glad that we're on the victory side, but there's no place for turncoats. There's no place for cowards. There's no place in Christianity today for those who will be quiet. We need people who will stand, who will stand to attention and say, look, I'm on the Lord's side and we are going to do things right. We're gonna do things properly. And we find here that Paul is saying, look, I charge you, Timothy, I told you these things. Don't you allow somebody to come in and teach some false doctrine. And then you look at uh, chapter one and verse 18, if you would. Verse 18, he says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So you can be a good soldier, as uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 points out. You can be a good soldier or you can be a poor soldier, but you are a soldier the moment, moment you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You become involved in the Christian life and join the army of Christians. Amen? And we see that. It's so vital for us to understand. He says, right again, I charge, I command. Then look at chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, that word exhort means to encourage. He says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And so there's that encouragement. It's not a suggestion. He says, this is what you need to do. And every pastor needs to do this. We need to pray for those in authority over us. And of course, even uh, Samuel said, I don't want to sin against God and ceasing to pray for the people of God that were under his charge there in the nation of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 15. We know that this chapter deals with those in service, the men in service, the bishops and the deacons. We see here in verse 15, which I believe is the key verse. It says, but if I tarry long, Paul writes, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Folks, uh, it's obvious by the word behave that there's a right way to have church and a wrong way to have church. And it's observable. You can see it. There's a lot of emphasis amongst nominal Christianity to say, well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. Yes, he knows your heart, but he also tells us to behave. And when we are to behave, that means that others can see our behavior, that it's holy, that it's right, that it's just, and it's according to the word of God. He says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself 
in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And this entire book is dealing with a local church. And so you and I need to come to grips with that, that we're not talking about a universal body. We're talking about a local assembly here. If you look at chapter 4, verse 6, this is problems in service. It says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he's given instruction, Paul is, to Timothy on how to be a good pastor, how to be a good minister of the Word of God. And he's laying it out, and there's so many commands and instructions given in this particular book. <laughs> Excuse me, if you'll go to chapter 4 and verse 11, and let me just apologize right now if I do some coughing. I picked it up sometime this afternoon. <laughs> And so I don't want to have to stop each time and say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I might be doing that quite a bit. Okay, so in chapter 4, verse uh, 11, it says these words, these things command and teach. So not only is Paul commanding Timothy, he's also saying, now, Timothy, you need to command these things as well. And he begins to lay that out. So there are some things where you just have to lay it on the line as a preacher, that's why we find in the Old Testament, he talks to one prophet and he says, don't be afraid of their faces. You preach my word. And we're to preach the word boldly. And then it says here in uh, chapter 4 and verse 16, we see, if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve the, the, them and let not the church be charged that it may relieve, excuse me, that's chapter 5. Verse 16 of chapter 4. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And so he's saying, you take heed, you be careful yourself. And that's something that we have to keep in mind in the ministry, of course, is we have to be very, very careful that we're not preaching to you and then we're not doing it ourselves. As we interpret the Bible, we've got to consider the overall purpose of the book as we look here at 1 Timothy. And keep that in view as we look at all the other passages. We need to find out, okay, who wrote the book and why was it written? And then we keep everything in its context. And so that's why when I've gone through these uh, six chapters, I pulled out various topics and just some of the overall encompassing views that we uh, see that the Holy Spirit of God brings to the surface. And that is encouragements while working with people. And it lays out the responsibilities as well of the local church. And so we see here in chapter 5, where it talks about people in service, the key here is verses 1 and 2 and verse 17. It says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And so it's important, you may go to your Greek if you want to, you don't have to, you've got a King James Bible, you've got 50 some odd plus scholars that have already checked out the things and so there's no errors in your Bible. And you, you, uh, even when you check the etymology of the words here, you find out uh, as a student of the Word of God how true the Word of God is, and you can have confidence in your King James Bible. And we find here that there should be a proper respect for the older members of the congregation listed here. And you see it's talking about elders here in verses 1 and 2. Also in verse 17 it mentions elder. But it's a different kind of elder that's mentioned there. Even though the same word is presbyteros there in uh, verses 1 and 2 as well as verse 17. But one is talking about the older members of the congregation, again by context. And then of course talking about the pastorals, the pastors, the pastorals, <laughs> the pastors in uh, uh, verse 17 of chapter 5. And so we should have, I, I have the point here, there should be proper respect for the older members of the congregation. And what I mean by that is, is society has the tendency to set the older people aside. 
They say, okay, you've got to retire by such and such a time, and they're sort of discounted by, oh, that's just so-and-so, and, you know, he's had his day, and so uh, they just need to move out and let us young bucks run things from here on out. And yet the Bible doesn't hold to that at all. It places a great deal of emphasis and respect that ought to be given to the older Christians in the congregation. I can remember when I was in a Bible college, my wife and I, uh, worked in the ministry. It was called F Sunday School. And uh, we worked in a rest home uh, ministry, Wildwood Manor Mount in Gary, Indiana. And that was a rough uh, town to be part of right outside Chicago. And I remember it was a 65 bed facility and I wanted to have a ministry that I could do with my family. I had, I was required to work in the bus ministry for a year, which I did. And then I was required, I wasn't required, but I worked in the uh, fisherman's ministry for uh, a year or so, year and a half. And then I went into the, uh, the rest home ministry and that 65 bed facility and my heart was blessed. I know I wanted to have a ministry with the family so my children, uh, I think uh, Laura and Michael and Mark were small at that time and we would take them and we would go from uh, room to room and we would uh, encourage the uh, clients to come out into the uh, the meeting area where they also fed them. And then uh, if they couldn't uh, help themselves, we were allowed to actually help them get into wheelchairs and, and come out to the day room there. And then we would sing and we'd have a service. And you know, my heart was blessed as I talked. This was way back in the uh, 80s, you know? And, and so my heart was blessed because there were a lot of them that still were alive during the Great Depression. And uh, as I talked to several of them, they would tell me how God met their needs and the blessings that they experienced, even though times were hard, and how God answered prayer and so on. Here, I thought many times I was uh, going to try to be a blessing to them, and I walked out of there being blessed. And so, you know, the older generation, uh, as we have this saying, been there, done that, uh, a lot of times we've not encountered some of the valley experiences that they have. Uh, they could uh, teach us much about the supply of God, the comfort of God through a myriad of problems and trials. And so it ought to encourage each and every one of us that when we find a older Christian who's walked with God, that we ought to say, hey, look, let's spend some time with them. They, have a they are a valuable resource that God still wants to use in the context of the local church. And the church does a great disservice by discounting the older generation. I know we get all excited when teenagers make a decision for the Lord, and we should. We get excited about the college and career when they're wanting to move forward for the Lord. That's great. The middle age, great. But I tell you what, we can learn a lot from the older generation. Things that they like to share that, hey, uh, watch out for this. And boy, it's something that they, you sit down with them and they can say, look, you know, uh, I, this generation needs to be warned about this and this generation needs to be warned about that. I got an email from an older gentleman in his 80s recently and he was laying out some things that he's seen through the years. You know, you need to take that to heart because he's been there and he's seen some things and he can say, hey, look, you know, the bridge is out over here and you need to be careful going down this particular road and yet we say, well, you know, we'll just check it out ourselves. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But then what happens when you have the wreck? And so we need to pay attention to the older generation. And what is really laid out for us, we see here, rebuke not an elder. That means respect them. That means we ought to teach our children to respect the older ones. Amen? I mean, respect has fallen by the wayside these days. We don't know the meaning of yes and no and uh, yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And you say, well, you're from the South. And so that's one of those kinds of things. And I know older folks will say, well, don't yes, sir, me, and you know, yes, ma'am, me, and that kind of thing. But I tell you what, you still need to show them respect. You need to get the door for them. You need to help them. Amen? You need to be careful around them. Amen. You need to show him respect. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers. In other words, if you talk sassy to your mother, you ought to have had your mouth washed out with soap. 
And you ought not mistreat and abuse even verbally the older generation. Even when you disagree with them, you ought to disagree agreeably. You ought to be nice and respectful to them. We need to bring respect back into society and bring respect back into the local church. And we see that that's ever so clear in this passage of Scripture. And I'm, it's interesting to me that way back, 2,000 years ago, this was having to be written in the context of a local church. So human nature is human nature. And there must have been a problem in the early churches, and there still are problems today, and we need to keep promoting respect for one another in the body of Christ in our local assemblies. A younger preacher should treat the older men as their father and the older ladies. And that, that's the same, the preachers ought to do the same. Even though I might have a position of authority, I need to be respectful when I approach the older generation. And so you've got to be careful also when handling disputes in regards to seeking uh, what's right and what's wrong and trying to bring about an amicable uh, solution to it. And you need to remember this in, in conflict. You're not trying to win an argument. You're actually trying to do what's right. And so being right is better than winning an argument. Amen? And so it could be that you're wrong. It could be that I'm wrong and you're right, and so on and so forth. There has to be that where we are seeking right, not to just simply say, hey, I got that one, you know, and mark it on, on, on a scorecard. And so, number one, I want to bring to our attention that there should be a proper respect for the older members of the congregation. And all the prime timers said, amen. You did hear that, didn't you? Amen? Amen. So I just made a lot of friends right there. Hang on, okay? <laughs> Number two, people have to be reminded to face up to their responsibilities. People need to be reminded to face up to their responsibilities. And you know, being saved means that you have some responsibilities that have been given to you, and I'm not going to digress and give all the responsibilities, but let's, let's just look at a few. Let's read a few here that's mentioned in the Scriptures. Let's start in verse 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. That means pay them back. For that is good and acceptable before God. Now what would happen back in those days, and I've explained this before, and we're going to delve more into details when we start going back through this book verse by verse. But when you look here, you find that the social network Back in those days, the Christians took care of Christians. You look at Galatians chapter 6, and it says you're to be good to all men, but especially they who believe. And so you and I need to remember that. We need to be good to one another. We need to be watching out one for another. And that's what Paul is trying to instruct Timothy here in regards to the local church. He's saying here the widows who've lost their, their, uh, their bread earner, their, their man, then the one who cares for them and provides for them, uh, then uh, the church needs to pay attention. Now, first of all, he says, you, if you're, you've got family in the church, then they need to rise to the forefront and they need to take care of that lady in need. They need to pay that back. Uh, that lady took care of you, she watched over you, and you owe it to her to take care of her when the husband dies. But if there's really one who does not have that opportunity to be cared for by family or the family refuses to, it says here uh, in verse 5, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Back in those days, you find that when there was a widow that was under the care of the local church, what happened was that she would give herself to the ministry of the church. She would then begin to visit. She would begin to uh, do some of the work within the church context, helping in the church, and so on and so forth. And uh, they would be busy about that. They'd be prayer, prayer warriors for the church. They were given an important role in the local church, and that is continuing the supplications and prayers night and day. You know, what an opportunity. 
for those who have retired or those who are single, those who are older and they're past the working age and so on, they have time on their hands where they can give themselves to the closet of prayer. And let's be reminded that God hears and answers prayer. And it's not a last resort, but a first opportunity that we have to really go before the throne of grace. And when we hear that phrase, nothing is impossible with God, can you imagine if there would be a huge number of older prayer warriors that have walked with God, seen God's hand active in their life, and they get on their knees and they pour out their heart to God for the local church and for its effectiveness in the community and around the world, what that would mean as far as revival is concerned? My, so everyone's important in the context of the church. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. So God's concerned about the children. He's concerned about the adults. He's concerned about the older folk too. And he's given us all an opportunity to serve him. So you're not all washed up, older folk. You have an opportunity that um, people who are engaged in working uh, 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, I'm sure a lot of them would say, I can't wait till I can get more time to be in my Bible and more time to be in prayer. And yet now you have that time. God's given that time. You're not just taking up space. You're not just warming a seat. You have an important role in the context of the church. You have an important role in the context of Pimena Valley Baptist Church. And we see here it says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they be not blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Pretty strong language, wouldn't you say? You know, I wonder what we would be like if Paul were standing up here and he were preaching and looking at some of us like this, you know, and just saying these words. A lot of times he said, I'm never going back there again. That guy hollered at me, you know. I didn't like what he had to say. Well, I'm sure there's a whole lot of things that, you know, here he is, uh, you know, uh, writing this. Can you imagine what it must have been like uh, hearing that? I mean, Timothy was, whoa, dad's mad. <laughs> dad's upset. Dad's making a point, you know. And so here we find it says, let's keep reading here. <coughs> Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. That's 60 years of age. So he, he lays out the parameters. See, God doesn't leave things up to chance. It's we who try to alter things and say, well, you know, we reason this out, we reason that out. And here, you know, Paul's just saying, this is what you need to do. Remember, this is God telling Paul this. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. And he says here, he says uh, in verse uh, t uh, 10, well reported of for good works. If she had brought up children, it's not that you just take anybody and everybody who says I'm in destitute and I have need. There's some qualifiers. He says, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. And I will get into this uh, in more in detail, but what it means is, is some when they are without a husband at a certain period of time in their younger years, they're thinking more about, hey, I, I don't want to just serve in the context of the church. I want to be married. And they are thinking along those lines. And so God has put this in here and given the okay, okay, to be married again, all right? Now notice what it says here in verse 12, having damnation, that's judgment, because they have cast off their first faith, and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. He says, look, you know, if you're not utilizing your time properly, what happens is you'll get to be a gossiper. You'll go around causing trouble. And you know, the, the tongue is a small member and it can cause a lot of damage. And we find that from James chapter three. It says in verse 14, 
I will therefore that the younger women marry, <coughs> excuse me, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. In other words, just because somebody has a handout doesn't mean that you go and give them what they want or what they need. You make sure that they qualify, even in the context of the local church. So that means sometimes you say, no, we can't help you. But then there are other times we say, oh, most definitely, you see. But God is the qualifier. People look at the church, oh, you guys, are, you're stingy, or you, know, you have a closed hand, and so on and so forth. That's not it at all. But he also wants us to be good stewards of that which he entrusts to us. And so we see that in this passage of Scripture. And so we see here that people have to be reminded to face up to their responsibilities. Number three, we look at verses 17 and 18, and we see here, and I know this is where I step uh, ever so gingerly because it, it's talking about the office that I hold and the pastors around here hold. And it says here in verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. No jokes about me being an ox. Okay. It says, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, one of the reasons why I try not to skip over things like this. I remember an older preacher back in uh, the early 90s telling me and saying, Mike, in church planting, if you don't preach the whole counsel of God and you don't teach these things, who's going to? And so sometimes as a pastor, we're intimidated to address certain topics in the scriptures because it may come across as being so self-serving. And we have the scandals that abound. We have those that have abused their position, to be sure. But at the same time, it doesn't negate the truth of the Scripture because of human failures. Because God's Word is true. And it's what ought to be up, upheld and uplifted because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And so it says here for pastors that you ought to care for the pastors. You ought to, first of all, Respect and prize the pastor. If you're part of a church, we've got several pastors here, so several former pastors here, they ought to be prized by their people. Why? Because God has given them a pastor, a shepherd, that will study the Word of God, pray for them, and then give them truth from the Scriptures. And I trust, feed on the best uh, grass possible the best pasture possible. And that's where you see even in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he's the one that has given in Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 16, he's the one that gives the local church the pastors. And there are literally churches across this land that are without pastors today. And when you don't have a shepherd in the flock, you can just mark it down. Somebody's going to take control. You can just mark it down that the sheep will scatter, as Jesus said in his earthly ministry. And so he's the one that has ordained there to be pastors. I don't know how those groups that don't believe in pastoral authority, I don't know how they really look at these particular books because these are the pastoral epistles. These are clear instructions from a pastor to a pastor. And we see here that you'd have to take out First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon right out of your Bible. Somebody, even in those kinds of settings, are gonna, is going to take control. There's going to be that strong personality. And that's why there has to be that God has ordained a, a man to be in the pulpit and to walk guard over that because of Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 31. You'll have the wolves from without, and you'll have the snakes from within that will try to rear up and lead away disciples after them, and they need to be dealt with. And so pastors should be properly cared for. They should be prized. They should be provided for. That means that they ought not have to worry about money. You can go out and you can make this, that, or the other, and work an extra shift or so on. Pastors can't do that. 
That's why we've tried as a church to really take care of our pastoral staff and make sure that they're at least keeping up with what's going on and how people are being paid in the community. But you know, we can't go down and sack groceries. We can't go and work on the side like that because we've got responsibilities here that we need to fulfill. I mean, it takes, it takes that time. And of course, we see that we are to protect the pastor. That's why you see here, as you continue to look here, uh, look what it says here in verse 19, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Boy, there's some real snakes. And I've encountered them in 35 years of ministry. I've been preaching for over 40 years. And there's some real snakes out there. And praise God for those who will rise up and say, let's go talk to the pastor about this then. It's amazing when the critics start speaking like that. The, the critics will go around and they'll, just, they'll pull somebody aside and they'll start, ju, 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 ju. they'll make little comments along the way and they'll see who has a listening ear. And then what they'll do is they'll key on that listening ear and then they start spreading their venom. That's what they do. That's how they operate. God has told us that. He says that's what's exactly what's going to happen. And he says here, he says, hey, if there's an accusation against the pastor, then you ought to, make, you ought to say, okay, let's, let's, let's go uh, see the pastor about that. So some critic comes to you and starts bad-mouthing the pastor, no matter which pastor around here it is. You ought to say, hold it right there. Don't say another word to me. Uh, let's get uh, deacon so-and-so and deacon so-and-so, or let's get brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so, and let's go, go to the pastor right now. And you know, you'll find real quick, like, what kind of an individual you're talking to then. Because more times than not, they'll put their tail between their legs and they'll head out the other direction. They say, oh, no, 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 it's not that big of a deal. And yet they have been used time and time again to split churches and key in on unsuspecting as well as immature believers and lead them astray. Because once you start spilling that venom out and allowing that to take root, then it causes somebody to go, hmm, I wonder. Boy, if, if he doesn't trust him, how can I trust him in this area, in this area, in this area? Isn't that what the Bible says here? Look what it says. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Because you know who the accuser of the brethren is? Yeah. It's the devil. Yeah. He accuses us before the throne of grace <laughs> night and day. Yeah. Don't get into the realm of the devil's crowd. Amen. He says this, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. If there's sin that's taken place, it needs to be dealt with. But you can't go by accusation. You know, I've had, I've had child and family services inspect our house on two occasions, and the threat of a third, where people in this church called to try to get my children jerked out of my home because they didn't like something I said. You think that's easy to go through? You think that doesn't affect the entire family? Oh, but you know what happens? They close the file. So what does it mean? Nothing. But what happens is people yammer and yammer and yammer and yammer and yammer, and they don't have a clue what they're talking about. I can remember a missions conference. Dr. Gene Burge was here. And I can remember the police called right after one of our night mission conferences and said, we'd like to talk to your two oldest boys, Michael and Mark. I can remember one of them come to me and say, Dad, what do we say? I said, you tell them the truth. You need not fear the truth. Rumors abound. I still hear them. People are so quick to believe falsehood rather than the truth. But regardless of the accusation, they accuse the Lord Jesus. So what chance do we fallible humans have when the tongues get to wagging? 
They said Jesus was illegitimately born. That's blasphemy. But they said that about our blessed Lord. They lied. They even put up false witnesses against him before Pilate. We need to be careful about that. We need to protect one another in our testimonies. You know what? When I, I remember being in a, a restaurant not too long ago where someone was talking about the wickedness of someone in this church, of their past life. Not the way they are now. And I, I couldn't keep quiet about it. They were yammering about that. And I said, you know what? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, but such were some of you. And I don't know what you're talking about, uh, you know, in the days gone by, but I know that individual saved now, trying to serve God, and we need to be talking about that. Amen. We don't, I, I don't need to sit there and say, well, yeah, I know this, and I know this, and I know this, and I know this. What good is that? Jesus Christ protects our testimony. The fact of the matter is I've been speaking the last several weeks on justification. Amen. What does he do with, with my sin? He buries them in the depths of the sea and he remembers them no more. He's not going to bring it up at the judgment seat. Why? Because in his mind they don't exist. He chooses not to remember them. Not to hold it against us. And we need to remember that. Your brothers and sisters in Christ sitting up here, you know what? They have, all of us have a past. Some, yes, we might say more wicked than others. But by the same token, we all have a past. And we'd all probably be embarrassed if the screen were to all of a sudden light up and our thoughts in the last 48 hours would be put on the screen for everybody to read. But praise God, we can come boldly before the throne of grace and we can find help and mercy before the throne of grace. And he'll continue to forgive us and give us that fresh start again. Hallelujah, what a savior. And so before we look down our long noses or my long nose at somebody, we need to remember the pit from which we've been digged. Pastors have a responsibility according to this passage of Scripture. I'm going to have to close here. Won't be able to get into chapter 6. But pastors have a responsibility to live right. I have a responsibility to live right. And when I do something wrong, I need to be quick to ask God's forgiveness. And if there's somebody else involved in the equation, I need to get their forgiveness as well. I've given this illustration before, but I remember some men were counting an offering in the old building. And um, I stuck my head in the door, and I don't know how we got into the conversation, but they started conversing with me about something. There was a disagreement. I thought there was tension there, and I just didn't like the way I handled it. And I can remember as I got home, the Lord was convicting me about that. And I said, you know, I said, okay. I'll call. And I remember calling the guys. The guy said, Pastor, I don't even know what you're talking about. They didn't even, they didn't even see that it was, I was the one that, it was, it was me, you know. But you know, I had to not only ask God's forgiveness, but I had to make sure that there was everything okay with those two men. And pastors have an obligation to try to live up to what they're preaching. And like I always say, you know, before a pastor preaches a truth to you and maybe steps on some toes and hits on some things that, you know, you don't like, we've already been worked over in the, in the study. God's worked on, you, you sit here for 35, well, for me, an hour. You, you sit here for an hour but yet, I've been studying this message for some time, and so he's been working me over a whole lot longer than he's working you over. And so, pastors need to live right. And we see that in verse 19 and following that says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Then that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So it doesn't matter who they are. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. He's saying, look, don't you just ordain somebody or turn the pulpit over to somebody and give somebody a responsibility when they're just newly planted, when they're just new in the faith. You just be very, very careful that you're not rash in giving somebody a spiritual responsibility of breaking forth the word of life. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand. Some guys you can, you can say, oh, they're doing wrong. <laughs> he says, Get going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. <laughs> Excuse me, so some men, you'll be able to identify right away, they're, they're, they're in sin, they're wrong. But then there are others that they may go their entire ministry and nothing's really pointed out, nothing's really seen, but don't think that anybody escapes. Because we all give an account. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God, Romans 14, 12. And so we see here, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. Sometimes you can see from the life of one how they live, praise God. But it also says, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. And so it's all going to come to light someday. So we pastors have a responsibility to live right. Uh, you church people have a responsibility to live right. But we all have the responsibility to pattern our lives according to the scriptures. And that's a learning and maturing process, is it not? Boy, there's some things when I got saved, I didn't know were wrong. <laughs> you know, I had no clue. But after I got saved, then the Lord starts showing me this and showing me that. I'm thinking, okay, okay, okay. I remember when my dad got saved, man, things that we used to do as a family, we couldn't do anymore. Why? He says, you're not doing that anymore because we're Christians. And Christians don't do this. And he would say, this is why. And he'd lay it out. That's going to be our entire life. He's going to be working a little bit here and working a little bit there and working a little bit here, just chiseling away on us. What's he doing? He is conforming us to the image of his dear son. And that's a beautiful picture, to be like Jesus. Amen? So don't be upset. Don't stiffen your neck. Harden your heart. When sometimes something comes your way and just, you just have trouble swallowing it, you just say, God, you're trying to teach me something. You're trying to show me something. And Lord, I'm going to surrender to it. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Help me to see this, but I'm going to obey it till till uh, I understand the full import of it. And even when I don't understand the full import, I don't think there's going to be any problem standing at the judgment seat of Christ, having given him the benefit of doubt.